Part 2 Emotional and Political Hurdles An Older Holocaust One of the first things you'll need to recognize is the fact that their culture was nearly exterminated from existence by a conquering European force of will. Some tribal groups simply ceased to exist completely. The word extermination is a strong one, but I believe it to be absolutely undeniable. As Europeans step foot on this continent, estimates of how many people were already here range as high as 60 million. Between European diseases and the outright butchering by adventurers and conquerors and the ravages of an unparalleled cultural clash, only a few million remain. What we now see of the Native American culture and their social structure, philosophy, and spirituality is a mere remnant of what it once was. Much of what they were was intentionally destroyed, not only to get rid of them, but to keep them from coming back. Unfortunately, I see the perceptions of many people as to why Europeans came here as extremely distorted. Also unfortunate was the fact that very, very few came here with any intentions resembling noble, particularly in the beginning. Most of the first Europeans that came here were almost exclusively exploitative profiteers, out to gain personal wealth and power and the spoils of plundering for their church or their sovereign. They were generally lying butchers that went on murderous killing sprees, slaughtering anyone they came across. If your tribe did not openly join them and become subservient to them, agreeing to butcher your way across the landscape, they simply annihilated your entire people. If their swords, dogs, or lances didn't get you, their diseases did. I will discuss the introduction of disease later. And there was a second wave. Once a century or two of the pillaging, conquest, and murdering had subsided, a different kind of adventurer began to arrive. I believe this trend to have been a natural evolution into something much more dangerous and insidious than open warfare with someone you know is trying to kill you. It was an evolution towards, quote, good intentions, unquote, and the majority of the newcomers were blind and deaf to the destructive nature of what they had started. Although greed was a strong motivator for expansion into the, quote, new world, unquote, the expansion of various forms of Christianity and the desire to own land were also strong contributors to Europeans' desire to so-called settle this new land. I believe, however, that an even more treacherous force rode on the backs of these other motivations that would eventually help generate the formula for the intentional, utter destruction of Native American culture. You have to remember that Europeans had developed a very specific social and political structure and had a very specific history. Their society, including religion, was permeated with the concept of an established hierarchy. This was called imperialism. Regardless of their apparent intent, nothing they did could shake this structure from their actions. Keep in mind that this societal structure requires absolute loyalty to and the trust of a central power. The nature of this structure is absolutely intolerant of any disloyalty or distrust of this hierarchy and requires all alien powers, forces, and structures to become subservient to it. For Europeans, this was an unavoidable way of thinking. For them, up until that time, it was an extremely efficient survival tool for the people. Leadership and governance through the power of a central body had helped Europeans survive a myriad of adversity for dozens of centuries. For a large block of this new society, the entities that became known as the colonies were merely an extension of this empire, and king, queen, and imperial power were an accepted norm. They had no other thought to starting a quote-unquote new world other than through commerce and conquest. Coming to the new world, for others, was the opportunity to flee this oppressive way of thinking and centralize domination. The problem was, as soon as they got here, most Europeans re-established the exact same structure of power, flavoring it as they saw fit. They wished to cling to the older values, merely establishing themselves as the new central power. They did not understand it was possible to have a completely different perspective on how society could be structured. In time, with exposure to the native population they found here, new ideals were infecting the way many thought. 
Some of the rhetoric of freedom that brought them here was beginning to make sense by observing the way the native people conducted themselves. But some of those who found themselves in positions of power in this new land were watching too, and they soon knew that their power could be undermined if the base of the population ever caught on. All of this too was in addition to the fact that there were many who came here as exiles and were sent to penal colonies. There was little hope of anything but a strong hierarchy under those circumstances. In the new civilian population, the older structure of centralized power was both knowingly and unknowingly regenerating itself, along with its nature of intolerance. The natural evolution of this generation of the old ways was to develop a system of protectionism. Those who became a part of this new central power came to know that the native perspective was that of the strength and independence of the individual, that all people have a God-given right and opportunity for self-determination. This completely undermined the concept of trust in and loyalty to a central force. At this time and in this way, I believe it was determined that the Native American culture was a direct threat to those who were loyal to the concept of a society ruled by an elite central power and that the only way for this power and structure to survive was to completely annihilate any reference to any other way of thinking. Thus, in my view, began the organized, intentional, and utter destruction of native peoples. It was a quote-unquote ethnocide that remains unparalleled even today. Fortunately, it did not entirely succeed. In my opinion, there have been two separate and distinct perceptions of the structures of our society that have been walking side by side throughout American history. One was inspired primarily by exposure to Native Americans' view of the strength and dignity of the individual, and the other was an unquestioned loyalty to a ruling elite. Those loyal to elitist imperialism have quietly and intentionally maintained an agenda of the utter destruction of the Native American way of life and made every effort to repress the strength of the individual. Although this struggle for power by those who perceive themselves as the ruling elite has included this appalling action against Native Americans, it has also permeated the whole of our society. You may discover later on that had we completely shed our European ways and allowed our new world to grow without this conflict and towards the established methods of the people already here, it would be a very, very different place than it is today. Recognize, though, that we are learning. It takes many generations to change the old into the new. The Holocaust has ended, and we have begun a new course in understanding the land we conquered. Gaining Perspective In order to comprehend some of the difficulty you may encounter as you learn about the original nature of Native American culture, try and understand who they are now. By my own experience and observation, Native Americans are going through a terribly painful rebirth of their culture, having only what may be called fragments and bits to work with. Sometimes I am amazed that any of it survived. Ripping children from their families to be taken away and quote-unquote re-educated, outlawed religion, denial of citizenship and the basic rights that go with it, and much, much more makes it miraculous that any of their traditions survived at all. Remember, though, that this several hundred year campaign to absorb them also succeeded in infecting their original philosophies with a heavy European influence. The concepts of the individuation of spirituality, social structure, politics, and philosophy all took a hard swing towards European thinking. Rebirth is in its infancy, and there is a lot of searching and confusion. I know a mother and son of Cherokee descent that follow Lakota spirituality because much of the Cherokee way has been lost. Many struggle with understanding the simplest of traditions simply because most of the people who carried the knowledge and the depth of it have all died long ago. Remember, too, that the European culture that dominates the overall American culture is by no means healthy. Our society is consumed with a struggle for purpose and identity. We have a lot of problems, and the old European perspectives we carry with us in many cases aren't fixing them. 
Many of us are seeking alternatives to the lessons our European ancestors brought with them to this place. I feel it is one of the main reasons our Native Americans' experiences need our attention, and this seems to be contributing to an increased awareness in their ancient culture. Right now I see, quote, Indian country, unquote, as split in half, and they are in conflict. They are dominated by two diverging perceptions of their cultural rebirth. The first, for some of them, is that of their right to have an ethnic identity of their own, to rebuild what once was, complete with teepees and the buffalo, separate from the rest of society. The second, for others, is their need to update and modernize their people to become part of the overall American culture, to become more Europeanish, along the lines of cultural absorption. A key motivation for this may be primarily to fight the extreme poverty many of them have been subjected to. Although there are many instances of a clear division between these two views within this struggle for regeneration, neither perception is completely wrong. In my opinion, both positions are extremes and should someday come together to form a more commonality of purpose. What is missing, I feel, is the long-range view of the purpose of this regeneration. As is true with the rest of us, they simply do not have a clear vision of the distant future and are struggling to find it. For the moment, recognize the fact that this struggle for identity is going on right now inside the Native American community. Understand that their past conflicts with their conquerors are still very present in their thoughts and will continue to be for many years. It will be a long road of recovery until they reassert their identity and reestablish their position in the overall society. And keep in mind that several generations have been exposed to European ways of thinking and have only recently been able to start on the road back. Remember, too, that you are also going through a struggle for identity. This struggle must include your ability to look at the distortions of the past for what they really are and recognize truth. Keep in mind that perceptions and truth can be entirely different things. You must learn to tell the difference to bring them together as one. Getting over the guilt. In terms of guilt, first of all, remember that most of us have not had the slightest idea that the intentional and systematic destruction of Native American culture was going on, or we were taught that it was right to happen. A tremendous amount of the current upswing in the interest in Native American related things is the recently raised consciousness of how cruel cultures of the world, primarily Europeans, could be when they came to this place. They came with, in large part, a need for conquering and domination. As a result, native people suffered immeasurably. This is an extremely simplistic perspective on what has happened on this continent for the last 500 years, but nevertheless is generally true. Then, what is to be done about it? Right now, I believe the raising of consciousness is exactly what should be happening, but we must be careful. If we wrap ourselves in a blanket of guilt and a resentment of our history, we will, and are beginning to be, blinded by what we see as an astonishingly savage past. If we do not learn from the past, we will be consumed by it. All too often, I have seen exactly this take place in many of people's first exposure to the native way of thinking. I did it myself for the first couple of years. What happened to native people was wrong and cruel and caused horrendous suffering and should never happen again. But what is beyond that? What comes after the recognition of the facts of our history? What comes after the start of the healing? Do we torture ourselves for the past deeds of our ancestors? Do we suffer in anguish and bring ourselves to blinding pain to compensate for half a millennium of abuse? Maybe a little. Perhaps we do need a portion of a reminder of what went on here, and perhaps we might connect these lessons of the past to all that of human history and learn from it. The caution here is not to be consumed by it. Do not throw away your own history, your own culture, your own ethnicity, your own heritage over the deeds of others who came before you. Learn from their mistakes and do not repeat them. See things for what they were and are, and work hard to change them. See the truth, tell the truth, and learn from the truth. Do not be blinded by it through guilt. 
Many people I have known that first learn about Native American spirituality and philosophy dive at lightning speed headfirst into it. I almost got to that point myself. I have seen others throw away a major portion of their lives and fall headlong into thinking that the only way to learn and live these ways is by denying who they are and where they come from. They want to start wearing buckskin and beads, pray that someday everyone will melt down their cars, burn their houses, and start living in teepees, and eating only fruits and berries. This is excessive. This is fanatical. This is not, quote, the way of the pipe, unquote. Native spirituality and philosophy is emphatically about balance and patience and understanding. It is about vision and knowledge of the truth and personal introspection and about the way of nature. And it is about accepting ourselves for who we are. It is about many other things, many of which I have only the smallest knowledge. I do know that it is not intended to consume you in guilt. Anyone you become involved with as you discover these ways, who makes you feel like that, be very careful. Apply the skeleton of the structure and the basic principles you learn to your life as you walk this way. Apply what you have come to know to your life as it is. Allow native traditions to be your guide, not a set of rituals and traditions. Allow those traditions to be a reminder of what is right and just. Remember that the, quote, red road, unquote, is the one you are on right now, not the one our native brethren were on 500 years ago. Recognizing the Natural Course Many of us have only recently come to know the extent of the damage to this land brought by Europeans. We have only recently begun to acknowledge the fact that much of it had an intentionally destructive nature. The rampages of De Soto are an excellent example of this. His so-called exploration throughout Florida and the southeast in the 1540s has been described as a campaign of death. His first priority was to kill off any and all people he came across, torture and interrogate any survivors to locate any of their quote-unquote treasures, and move on to the next bloodbath. They would use trained dogs as their first surprise attack. The dogs would kill anything that moved. Next, knights in armor, yes, knights in armor, and on armored horseback, would cut and slash their way through a virtually defenseless quote-unquote enemy with broadswords and spiked maces. Lastly, De Soto would move in with troops and their lances, steel swords and bows. If they chose, nothing was left alive. What makes all this so tragic and so sad is that he truly believed he was doing the right thing. He believed that they were all filth in the eyes of God and deserved to die. He felt it was his perfect right and obligation to slaughter them and take whatever quote-unquote wealth they had back to the sovereigns of Spain. Finally, he died insane and diseased before he could finish his quote-unquote campaign without finding the wealth he had sought. But he was only one of many. The first aspect that makes a series of events like those quote-unquote natural is the fact that Europeans simply had no other way of looking at the world. Under the authority of your king and queen, and for the, quote, glory of God, unquote, your right to slaughter was a perfectly acceptable course of action. Europeans felt natural in the setting of conquerors. It is obvious to me that a clash of this magnitude was inevitable. One intensely dominant characteristic of European culture at the time was the attitude that if you can do something, you should do it. If you have the ability to arm yourself and march into your neighbor's land, kill his people, and steal all his things, you should do it. It's his problem that he didn't have the ability to defend himself. This attitude made Native Americans, quote, ripe pickings, unquote, on a continent where wars were rare and counting coup on your enemy was considered more honorable than killing him. Once Europeans had the boats to get here, their acts were simply a natural extension of their way of life. One difficulty some of us invent for ourselves in examining the history of this expansion is in not accepting the fact that Europeans are God's creation too. We are either blinded by the arrogance that what was done was right, 
or we are so appalled and ashamed that we can only think it to have been the work of truly evil men. Neither is the case. It was simply the natural course of action for a people that found its land swelling with population and had the tools to get the job done. Lastly, and perhaps even more important, there was the element of disease. If you are willing to accept the fact that it was inevitable for Europeans and others to come to this land, you must also accept the fact that their diseases were destined to come with them. These diseases were cultivated through plagues and famines that were naturally occurring events in Europe and the other areas in which they were spawned. Even though the introduction of these diseases wreaked havoc and destroyed entire populations through indescribable misery, it is unavoidable to admit that the process was completely natural. It simply remains a fact that they were cultivated by natural processes over there and simply did not exist over here. Since the two worlds were clearly destined to meet, disaster was inevitable. To help put things in perspective, at the beginning of the Dark Ages, the Black Plague, in just a few short years, killed half the population of Europe. As on this continent with Native Americans, whole villages simply ceased to exist. Ancient knowledge passed down was lost forever, and growing healthy cultures were permanently and irreparably damaged. All of these events were much too powerful and long-term to have been controlled by man. They were events that had to take place as a part of the destiny of our world. No Right to Question Often I see people struggling with this question. What right do we have doing all this? What right do we have coming to this place? What right do we have creating technology? Who gave us the right to build things and refine and burn oil and invent cars and trains and planes? Many of us see the growth, expansion, and improvement of the human race only as an evil thing. We were better off the way we were. We don't need all this technology. We're just killing ourselves and the planet for no reason. Ponder this. The power of man has only one source his creator. This power is not derived from some inner force exclusive to man and man alone. All things in the universe are, quote, of God, unquote, and by that so is man. What man does as the mouse burrows his tunnel, as the sparrow builds her nest, is all done by God. The difference is in free will. Free will is a great and dangerous gift of the creator. It separates our destiny from that of all other living things. It gives us, quote, choice, unquote, and provides a view of the universe that our fellow creatures do not have, and it bears a great burden. Cut loose in the world, we are not shown the million-year-old path to migrate. We are not shown where and how we must build our homes. The knowledge of what we must kill and eat is something that must be learned, and our destiny is clouded by our freedom to choose it. The secrets of the universe and a place in it are supplied to every creature and thing, save one, man. Ours is a journey of discovery and hazard, of responsibility and obligation. It is a sacred journey and a great gift. We should not question our gift of ignorance or the challenge of traveling past it. We should accept those who came before us along this path and learn from them. If theirs was wrong, we should not go that way. If their way was right, we should listen to what they have learned and live it. We must also never forget that ours is a profound ignorance, and the road is a long one. This should keep us humble. This should help us respect our brethren in the rest of creation who remain enlightened and in the care of the Creator. History has happened the way it happened for a reason. We are simply too removed from the happenings of the universe to presume to know why. Remember this thing. Keep yourself humble, but remember that the gift of free will is provided for us and us alone to overcome our profound ignorance. The Constitution of the United States a legacy preserved. 
An important aspect of all this is that few people have come to know or understand the fact that we carry most of the Native American principles within the legacy of our quote-unquote European ancestors. There were those who attempted to pass this new way of thinking on to us and shed the old European concepts. We refer to these ancestors as our founding fathers, and the legacy is our own constitution and declaration of independence. In 1754, a delegation of officials representing the Crown of England attended a conference in what was to become New York State. The meeting was between this group and a delegation of elders representing the five tribes of the Iroquois nation. One member of the Crown's delegation listened to the dissertations of the elders with great interest. The Iroquois elders cataloged their philosophy, social and political structure, and spirituality. This delegate had a scribe record these speeches and was responsible for printing and distributing the transcription to Crown officials. This printer was so moved and so changed by what he read in the document that he spent the remainder of his life in the quest of incorporating these principles into the new emerging American culture. The printer was Benjamin Franklin. As the eldest member of the group we call the Founding Fathers, he was the key individual to introduce and promote the foundation of the Constitution we treasure today. In my opinion, the conflict we've witnessed in history has not been primarily between the, quote, red man, unquote, and the, quote, white eyes, unquote, but, but between the two diverging perceptions of the power structure within a society. Unfortunately, Native Americans became the primary victims of this struggle as it unfolded in the last 500 years on this continent. Remember that although it is right to feel badly about how all this came about, your emphasis at this point should be on the fact that that was then and this is now. Alongside Native Americans, we are currently trying to build the American culture from the ashes. The Native Americans' struggle to reconstruct their heritage from the scraps of what they once were is an extremely painful and taxing process. Our struggle, as those outside the Native American community, is one of recognizing the truth of history and, most of all, vowing not to continue or repeat it. In large part, this includes understanding the truth of where our Constitution and Declaration of Independence comes from and the core of the substance the writers attempted to include in them. As someone who seeks to understand the Native American way of thinking, if you do not separate yourself from the negative aspects of history, and put the guilt of your society's past deeds in proper perspective, your thinking will be clouded and you will find yourself lost and consumed by it. Understand and respect what our founding fathers were attempting. Go to the original sources and discover their depth for yourself. <laughs>
Recognize, however, that these two terms are not used with their literal definition in mind, rather that a popular notion of what each represents has developed. Liberals can be characterized as quote-unquote sensitive and caring people, those who feel badly about the things that we may be doing wrong as a society. They are also those that have a far-reaching acceptance of a variety of human behaviors, many quite distant from anything we might consider quote-unquote conventional or even remotely acceptable. Most importantly, they have, although few would admit it, a very strong patriarchal perspective on what a political system's role should be in the daily activities of the average person. Their feelings are so strong about the need to fix things that they have come to believe that only an entity as large and powerful as a government can do anything about it. By their behavior and their views, comments, and activities, it is clear that they feel their place is to either be the voice of the quote-unquote downtrodden and are obliged to demand resolution of these issues from the structure of power that so-called governs us, or they feel that they are the chosen few that are obliged to utilize the resources of others to fix society's ills and woes. Some of us have gotten to the point where we elevate our politicians and so-called leaders to near royal status and look to them and them only to solve our problems. It has become obvious to me that the liberal perspective of patriarchy and the random application of resources in a desperate attempt to fix things is a distorted legacy of our imperialistic heritage. The use of wealth and resources without direction in emotional attempts to solve things is simply childish. Feeling bad and spending money simply isn't enough. Liberals simply do not understand, or perhaps do not accept, the principle of personal responsibility. Conservatives, on the other hand, have problems of their own. The progression of the human spirit is not always at the top of their lists. Keeping things as the so-called status quo seems to be a frequent priority. Often, in various segments of the conservative community, the guise of individual freedom will be utilized to actually repress the individual spirit. Religion often plays an important role in this insidious endeavor. Conformity to a fixed set of rules and expectations becomes the priority in everyday life, rather than the exploration of the human adventure. Liberals are simply excessive in their approach to the freedom of the individual. Almost any bizarre behavior becomes perfectly acceptable. Conservatives have a great deal of difficulty accepting the world outside their very narrow set of rules. The result of these two extremes is conflict and confrontation. The conservative, however, has one set of concepts to cling to that are just and right and most critical to observe our Declaration of Independence and Constitution. Although they may be interpreted as weak representations of the principles that our Native American brethren attempted to bestow on us, they carry with them the key points from which we can learn. Conservatives generally understand one vital clause in our Declaration of Independence that liberals do not. In my opinion, our Founding Fathers left out one critical word in one phrase of our Declaration of Independence that might have changed the course of history. Liberals generally believe that the phrase, quote, all men are created equal, unquote, is to be interpreted that anyone that is ever born should be provided for in exactly the same manner. Conservatives recognize the correct context of this phrase, meaning that all men, all people, are created with equal opportunity. This perspective is extremely Native American. In recognizing the challenge of life as an individuated one, we all have an equal chance to find our way. Liberals generally do not believe this, or at least they believe that anything individual should be something almost exclusively outrageous. Conservatives believe, when they can break ties with their fixed and narrow expectations, that all of us have the individual right to, quote-unquote, succeed. Native Americans believe strongly in the concept of success. Success in survival, success in learning the depth of one's purpose in life, in nurturing the family and the community, and much, much more. Their orientation was, however, quite different than other cultures. Their focus was generally on contentment and fulfillment rather than physical enrichment. The conflict of liberal and conservative should be a priority for us to resolve, 
we will wallow perpetually in our own anger if we do not. I recently heard a quote that I find particularly poignant. If you are not a liberal at age 20, you have no heart. If you are not a conservative at age 30, you have no brains. A reflection of the times. The Core Contrast of Cultures In addition to what I've already discussed, there's one central contrast that puts Western culture almost completely opposed to Native American culture. It's merely a matter of perspective, but it is a critical perspective. The foremost central characteristic of Western culture is based on the idea of, quote, information, unquote. What I mean by that is that nearly everything we do is premised on the fact that we have it, rely on it, and almost literally treat it as a god, or at least our closest ally. We even go so far as to hoard and protect it, using what others don't know against them. It's beyond a quote-unquote tool and becomes a partner in how we approach virtually everything we do. Even that is premised largely on the idea that we have vast amounts of information, or knowledge, and that most of what we know is right, or at least we'd like to believe it is. Native Americans have a completely reversed perspective, and in my view, the correct one. Their foundation for nearly everything they think and do is based on the idea that we know almost nothing. Even elders that have spent lifetimes studying, learning, praying, and participating in ceremony, or just life, accumulating vast amounts of, quote, information, unquote, still proclaim their humbleness and ignorance. In my view, this can be the only way of things. Little in Western culture thinks this way. The very words expert and authority reflects just how far we take things. How many times have we heard so-called experts proclaim for decades that a certain thing is a certain way, only to hear them quietly admit, when they even do, that something else has come to light that's proven them wrong the entire time? Now, there's nothing wrong with either the word or even the basic concept of, quote, expert, unquote. But again, we take things too far. We are empirical about things, relying on what we consider, quote, physical proof and repeatability, unquote, when so-called facts are overturned time and time again. Not only do we have an unrealistic view of what a, quote, unquote, fact is, we frequently confuse hypothesis with fact. Worse than that, we constantly commercialize so-called facts that aren't facts at all, merely for the sake of commerce, politics, or religion. A fact isn't what we perceive it to be, but what it is in reality, and not our reality, but the universe's, and ultimately God's. There's simply no way for us to have a complete understanding of facts or information without being God. Regardless of your area of expertise, the length and depth of your experience at something, the totality of your ignorance crushes it like a bug. Why this simple reality isn't pervasive in our thinking is completely beyond me. This is a critical characteristic and propensity of human beings to treat with great care. Arrogant. At no time and under no circumstances can a human being ever justify conceit under the guise of expert. A thousand years from now, even our descendants, hooked into the vast accumulated knowledge of the generations that came before them, compared to the totality of information in God's universe, will still know next to nothing. In this way, our society is completely upside down. Arrogance is a temporary quote-unquote win. It simply doesn't last. Arrogance is intellectual and emotional brute force. Force has proven time and time again to have a very short reign. Not only can we not justify hoarding information, we will be lying to ourselves every time we imply we know it all. Learn, yes. Use what you know like a weapon, no. You don't have that right. If you use it that way, either you or your descendants will suffer the consequences. End of part two.